Have a seat. Hey, that was awesome. Thank you. All right, church, we're, we're continuing in this sermon series called In God We Trust, and you'll notice the S in trust has that cute little dollar sign there. It's a hidden meaning there, just to give you an insider's tip. And, you know, I was, I was in the sanctuary earlier this week, and we had these images up on the wall, and it struck me for the first time just how interesting it is that we have In God We Trust on our currency. Have you ever thought about that? How interesting it is that we have that. And so I did a little research, did some digging, and found that in 1861, a pastor wrote to the Secretary of the Treasury, this is just on the verge of the Civil War, and said, we need to acknowledge Almighty God on our currency, lest the other nations think us to be heathens. His words. And so a couple of years later, uh, the, the United States adopted this and put it on our coins, this whole phrase, in God we trust. And it was about 100 years later uh, that we adopted it as our national motto and put it on our paper currency. Now the thing that's so interesting to me about the fact that we have in God we trust on our money is that money is the one thing other than God that I think most of us, most of the time, are most tempted to put our trust in. Money is the one thing other than God that most of us, most of the time, are most tempted to put our trust in. And so it's so perplexing to have in God we trust on our money. It's almost logically incoherent. It'd be kind of like going to an OSU game and singing Boomer Sooner. <laughs> or going to Wrigley Field and you go and you see on that great classic marquee, Go Cardinals. Or be like winning the award for most humble. Like it just doesn't make any sense. As soon as you've accepted it, you've disqualified yourself for it. The saying, God, we trust on our money is so perplexing because money is that one thing other than God that most of us, most of the time, are most tempted to put our trust in. And yet, this is where we are. In the Old Testament, uh, people were tempted to put their trust in idols. You know, Baal or Ashtoreth or Ashkelon. Actually, that's a city. All these false gods of the, of the pagan world, of the Canaanite tribes. And to tell you the truth, I'm not too worried about anyone in this, word, in, in this room worshiping Baal or Dagon. I'm not too worried about anybody worshiping one of the idols of the Old Testament. But am I concerned at all about the relationship that we have with money and the effect that money has on my heart and on your heart? Absolutely. And Jesus was pretty forthright about this. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. And he draws a really clear line in the sand. God, money, pick one. Pick one that's going to get your loyalty and your love. Another time, Jesus tells a story, a parable intended to illustrate a bigger point. He tells a parable about this farmer who goes out to scatter his seeds. And he, and he, exchanges the, he throws the seeds out liberally. And some of it falls on the path, and the birds come and they eat it up. And some of the seed falls in rocky soil, and it sprouts up quickly, but it doesn't have any opportunity for roots. So when the sun comes out, it withers away. And some of it falls among thorns, but the thorns choke out its growth. And some of it falls among good soil. And Jesus explained that the seed that falls among the thorns is the person who hears the gospel who hears the good news about what God the Father is doing in Jesus Christ and is eager to respond, said, but the worries of this life, now pay attention, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it out. Jesus communicated that money was the number one rival, the number one competitor for our allegiance to God and God's kingdom. Also said that, that money and our relationship with money had the potential to choke out our response to the gospel. And yet, it's impossible to go anywhere without interacting with money. Anywhere in the world, name a culture. Okay, don't name one because there may be an exception. But the overwhelming majority of cultures in the world have some kind of trade currency. So why would Jesus make such a big deal out of something that is so common, so unavoidable in all of our lives and all of culture for all of time? And I think the main reason was that Jesus understood that money had a unique position of power in our hearts. It was a shaping influence. Money could do things within us that would be destructive for God's 
purpose is. The reason is that money can be like magic in the way that it can practically open doors to experiences and relationships and assets and people. If you've got money, money tends to open doors. Money does things. Tom shared the quote last week, I've been poor and I've been rich. Rich is better. There are things that money definitely helps with. Money in our world is like power. It's something that can be used for good or for evil. But our obsession with money, whether you have money or don't have money, is something that can't help us. Our obsession with money cannot solve us, cannot buy us out of the spiritual poverty that we have apart from a relationship with God revealed in His Son, Jesus Christ. We hear the story again and again and again of a celebrity who made it big, or an athlete who finally got their big break, or regular people like us who finally get a a little money at their fingertips. And they find in the end that it doesn't deliver what they thought it would promise, what they thought it would, it would deliver. And I've had people in my office who have great wealth at their fingertips, and they've shared with me that money couldn't deliver on the things that they most wanted in life, that money couldn't heal that broken marriage, that money couldn't, uh, couldn't heal them in the way that they wanted, that money couldn't do and couldn't achieve those ultimate things. No amount of money can buy us out of spiritual or emotional or relational poverty. So because money was such a big issue to Jesus, and because money can be the very thing that chokes out our response to the gospel and is a rival for our allegiance to him, we need to talk about money, not because of money, but because of money and its relationship to Jesus and our discipleship. So to guide our conversation, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. That's where we are for this whole series. And as you're turning there, just give you uh, some context that Timothy was a young pastor, and his mentor, Paul, was writing this letter to him. Timothy was probably about my age, and he was a pastor in this port city of Ephesus. If you've ever read the book of Ephesians, that was a letter to the church in Ephesus, where Timothy was a pastor for a period of time, and he's struggling in his ministry. Uh, The work is hard in Ephesus. He even wants to leave the church, and so Paul is writing him to urge him to stay, to do the work of pastoral ministry, and to also give him some coaching on a particular situation that is dividing the church. That, that issue that was dividing the church had to do with this group of people within the church that just loved to stir up controversy. There were the people in the Sunday school class who just wanted to act, just wanted to like stir up a fight and see what people's response was like. Nobody's ever had that experience in this church, I'm sure. But they were the kind of people that just loved to kind of pick a fight and see what would happen. And what they would do is they would pray on some of the wealthier members of the congregation and they would go to them and they would sow seeds of doubt about the pure gospel that had been taught by Paul and preserved within the church under Timothy's leadership. And they would pose as these kind of spiritual gurus or specialists and they would make a living off of it. And it was dividing the church. These people were using a front of of, uh, being a guru or a teacher, of this front of being religious as a way of getting what they really wanted in life, and that was money. It was all a guise. It was all a distraction from what they were really all about, and it was money. It was like they were using God to get good financial karma, and so Paul described these people as people who are using godliness to make financial gain, and this is the text we read last week. You can see in verse 6, Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. He says this, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, in spite of what we just read, Paul is not anti-rich people. In fact, in the text we're going to read next week, Paul is going to lay out, here's the right way to be rich. If you're rich, here's the best way to do it. It is such a fun text. We're going to love it. But if your aspiration in life, if the thing that wakes you up in the morning is the prospect of getting your hands on a little more money, If at the end of your life you acquired wealth and were satisfied, Paul says that is an empty pursuit. 
And not only is it empty, it's harmful. People who want to get rich throw themselves into a river that's going to take them to a place that they don't want to go. If you love money, if your chief ambition in life is acquiring money, you are, in the words of Scripture, a fool. It's a trap. And then Paul shifts his focus to talking to his spiritual son, to Timothy. We're going to be in 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 through 16. And in response to the reverence we have for God's word, let's stand and read this together. Verses 11 through 16. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. You can be seated. The first two words of this passage are powerful. But you. But you. And those two words, but you, are a strong summary of Christian ethics. This is the way the world works in a given situation. This is the way that that everybody seems to be talking about this particular issue. But you, man of God, woman of God, you're called to be different. This is the way everybody does things. This is the way we've always done it. But you, man of God, but you, woman of God, are called to be different. In this world, people who follow Jesus are supposed to look and smell and appear different because we're going in a different way. We're following a different teacher. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, live like this. But I say to you, you man of God, you woman of God, it's more like this. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You've heard that it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother or his sister is committed murder. We could come up with some of our own today. You have heard that it was said, it is your body. Do with it whatever you want. But I say to you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, honor God with your body. You have heard that it was said, it's your money. Spend it however you want. Make yourself happy. But I say to you, to you, to whoever has been entrusted much, much will be expected. We could do this again and again and again. Take the prevailing logic of our day. Take the wisdom of the world and put that but you in the middle of it. But you, man of God, you, woman of God, you are called to be different. The wisdom of God turns the wisdom of the world on its head. And so what is wise in the eyes of God may be foolish in the eyes of the world. And if people start thinking we're dummies, it may be that we're on the right track. It may be. The way of Jesus is necessarily and by definition at odds with the prevailing logic and reason of our time. We as the people of God are supposed to have what we could call a prophetic edge. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be cutting at culture. We're always coming at things from a different angle. Yeah, this is how so-and-so thinks about this. But you, man of God, but you, woman of God, are called to be different. I think many of us have sensed just how emotionally tense things have been in our country in the last week. I mean, some people have been, you know, thrilled uh, with what happened in any number of elections or state issues. Some are crushed. Uh, Some don't know how to make sense of all this. All of us are just trying to stay away from Facebook. But in moments like this, What does it look like for us as the people of God to maintain a sharp prophetic edge? 
maybe one of the things that we most need to remember is that we are, while we are gratefully citizens of this country, and thank God for our opportunity to be citizens of this country, our first citizenship and our first allegiance is to a king and his kingdom. And that is where we get our identity. That is where we find our hope. Having a prophetic edge as a church is reminding one another our first citizenship is to the kingdom of God and our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ, our king. Our life is supposed to reflect the values of that kingdom first. And it may or may not ever align with our political party of choice. And until we elect Jesus as president, we need to keep that prophetic edge sharp. Amen? Paul continues, in spite of the way that some people are being swept up with this love of money, this, this ridiculous pursuit of money, you, man of God, are supposed to be different. And woman of God, you're called to be different. And he uses two active words. He says, Timothy, my son, I want you to flee. And I want you to fight. I want you to pursue something. I want you to flee. Take the prevailing logic of our day. The way that everybody is doing it. The way that everybody is behaving. And run from it. Especially when it comes to money. Do you want to choke out the gospel within you? Then keep going down that path. But if you want to preserve the purity of what God is doing, run from this with all of your might. Flee from it. But we're not just supposed to flee from it. We're supposed to pursue something else. It's not enough to have the absence of vice. We have to have the presence of virtue, a character. So he tells Timothy to flee. And he tells Timothy that there's something we need to pursue. Grab your bulletin or grab a scrap of paper or your phone. And I want you to make uh, two columns, okay, or two lists. And at the top of one of those lists, I want you to write the word flee, F-L-E-E, -E, flee. And at the top of the other list, I want you to write the word pursue. When it comes to the world of our finances, we're called to flee from some things and we're called to pursue other things. So what are those things in regard to your finances that would choke out your response to the gospel? What are those areas of our finances where we need to run like fire away from? To be candid, one of the struggles for me when it comes to uh, relating to the world of money is tied to image. Because money and image are so closely tied together this is what happens. I mean, this is a universal struggle, but especially happens, I think, with people who are in their 20s and 30s. We're, you know, out of school or we're working. We're out of our parents' house. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to impress. We want to get established. And so there, be, there, there enters into the picture this quiet competition with our peers. And we want to kind of measure up with one another. Social media exacerbates this issue because we see, oh, so this is what so-and-so did with their, their kid. Or did you see their house? Or did you see the car they're driving? They always dress really, really well, and I can't, I want to compete with that. I struggle with that comparison trap, with that image game. And so if I'm writing down a list, what does it look like for me to flee from the way the world typically works? I need to flee from the comparison trap. I'm the only one in the room, aren't I? What does it look like for you? What do you need to flee with regard to your finances? Some of you need to flee from debt. You are so hemmed in with debt, you can't do anything. You feel shackled to your debt. Some of you need to flee from debt. Some of us need to flee from our addiction to acquiring stuff. We're replacing stuff that's not even broken. We're getting new stuff just because we can. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. What do you need to flee from in the area of your finances? Where in the world of money... Uh, are there those little things, those quiet corners that might choke out your response to the gospel or might rival your allegiance to Jesus Christ? What are those things that you need to flee from? And what are those things you need to pursue? What are those things you have to run after in your, in your life in the area of finances? For me, uh, I'm so blessed. I, I grew up with my parents who modeled for me generosity. Uh, you know, like, like Jim and Jordan Linderman, I learned this from my parents. And so, from the time I had my first job in the seventh grade, um, I, I just knew you give 10% to the church. That's just what you do. And so my working assumption has always been not you live on 90%. And that's just the way I was raised. It's my norm. 
but what does it look like for me to pursue godliness in the area of finances? Or what does it look like for you? Well, where I am right now and where Emily and I are right now in conversations is maybe that God's calling us to give uh, until we start to squirm just a little bit. Until the hand starts kind of shaking, we want to pull it back when it comes to putting it in the offering plate. Or saying yes to supporting that missionary or yes to that person on the street corner. It may be that God's calling us to give until it squirm, or until we squirm, until it hurts just a little bit. Now, 10% may be a really lofty goal for some of you because of, because of debt, because you're getting your finances in order, and giving at 10% or beyond 10% is a really worthy place to start. Others of us, 10% is not even scratching the surface. And we can give 10% and, and pat ourselves on the back, and yet God is calling us to more costly obedience and more radical generosity. In the area of our finances, what are those things that God is calling you to flee from? And what are those areas that God is calling you to pursue? One of the best books that I've read in the last year, it's called Strong and Weak. It's by Andy Crouch, who's the executive uh, editor of Christianity Today. I would also highly recommend Christianity Today. And Andy lays out, he makes this argument that, that the real sweet spot for flourishing in life is when you have the right combination of authority, which he just describes as the ability to do stuff. You all have authority because you chose to come here today. If you gave a, a word of encouragement to someone, you used your authority to encourage. Authority is our ability to do things. It's agency. He said, but we don't just need high authority, we also need high vulnerability. And he describes vulnerability as exposure to meaningful risk. And so if you want to live in the sweet spot of life, you are using all of your authority, but you're also putting yourself in a place of risk. And he says there are some kind of people who have low authority, but they have high vulnerability. And that leads to suffering. All of us at some day are going to be on our, our deathbed. All of us are going to be sick. In that moment, we will have high authority. We won't be able to save ourselves, and our, suffer, our, our vulnerability will be high. Others of us have low authority and low vulnerability, but we've gotten there because we've withdrawn from the world. We think, if I enter into relationships with people, it's just going to be too painful. I'm not going to go there. Or if I even turn on the TV, I'm going to be overwhelmed by the news, so I'm just going to kind of block everything out. I'm going to put my head in the sand and just not let anything affect me. I'm just going to play video games in my basement or whatever it is for you. I don't play video games. So those people are withdrawing. And, and honestly, I think that's the great temptation of, of people in my generation and younger is that the world is so overwhelming that we just want to detach and withdraw. Others, though, have really high authority, but they have really low vulnerability. This is what leads to, to tyrants to people who behave in those ways. People who have high authority but low vulnerability are always going to exploit the people who have low authority and high vulnerability. There's all these different ways in which we can live. And yet when I think back to times in my life when I have felt the most alive, when I have felt that, yes, I am firing on all cylinders, this is it. It's been times when I've had high authority. I've used every gift God has given me given me, but I've also risked it and kind of freaked myself out. Now, I'm having one of those moments right now. I have high authority because of this little thing that's attached to my face, and George turned my mic on so you can hear me, and I'm going to be a little bit louder than other voices in the room. I have high authority in this moment, and yet I also have high vulnerability because all of you, when you leave, somebody's going to ask you, how was the sermon? And you're going to give an answer. All of you are in one way or another judging me just like I would judge whoever's preaching up here if I were in your chair. And my worst of all fears is that someday I'm going to spontaneously vomit in front of all of you. That is the greatest vulnerability I've ever known. That's my biggest fear in life. But I'm in a moment where I'm having high authority. I'm also having high vulnerability, exposure to risk. Now what does this have to do with our money? Here's what I think it has to do with our money. You've all been entrusted with something, everybody in the room, with the ability to act, with a skill, with a, with a resource. All of you have been entrusted with something. You have authority. Now, maybe not in every single situation of your life. There are things we can't control. But you have high authority. 
Now, when it comes to our money, we want high authority and no vulnerability. We want to go to our financial advisor and see all greens. We want to have so much money that we never have to think about it again. We want to be in a place where we don't have to think about how to make the car payment or how to pay for groceries. That's what we all want. And yet that's not the sweet spot for flourishing. The sweet spot for flourishing is when we have high authority, but we're also in a position of risk. We're also in a position where things could fail. And when we give, and especially when we give for some of the first times, oh my goodness, that vulnerability feels so high. Because when I give God that dollar, that's one less dollar that I have. It feels like a zero-sum game. The more dollars I give away, the more vulnerable I become. And yet, isn't there something about the nature of the gospel wrapped up in the middle of that? Didn't Jesus say whoever wants to save their life, whoever wants to control their life, will lose it? But whoever loses their life, whoever surrenders control of their life for my sake, will find it. It's when we put ourselves in that position of high authority and we leverage that authority to put ourselves in places of vulnerability that we find the sweet spot in life. How many of us want to be on our deathbed and say, I played it safe? How many of us want to be on our deathbed and say, I never bet big on anything? As I'm thinking about my, my life, as Emily and I pray, who do we want to be? We think about this church. What kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to be a kind of church that just sat safe with our authority, with our resources, and never risked a thing? Or do we want to be the kind of people and individuals and families in a church that risks it all for the gospel, that puts everything on the line for Jesus and there find the sweet spot of authority and vulnerability, going out on the ledge with Jesus and seeing what miracle he's going to provide. And that's precisely what Jesus did when he came. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the image of the invisible God, now exalted at the right hand of the Father, entered into creation, entered the womb of a teenager. Talk about vulnerability. The, the, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, took, he took on the very nature of a servant and made himself obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we see Jesus on the cross, his body exposed to the elements, his wounds evident. Jesus is having the greatest moment of vulnerability, and yet that is also the highest authority. It is because of his willingness to enter vulnerability, to enter risk, that he might reap the rewards for the kingdom of his Father. It's because Jesus used his authority to enter vulnerability that we have been brought into the family of God. What if you risked it for Jesus? What if you called your neighbor and invited them to dinner and just asked them about spiritual things? What if you did that thing that you know you're supposed to do, but oh, it's too risky, but what if you risked it for the sake of Jesus Christ and his kingdom? Man, you're joining a good company of people our brothers and sisters in Christ who through the millennia have made witness to the resurrection and the reign of Jesus Christ with their lives. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy to do. He said, you made that good confession when you were baptized. In our baptism, we count ourselves dead to sin and we count ourselves alive to Christ. We say yes to this life of vulnerability and risk and sometimes failure because that's the way that the Lord Jesus lived. And we want to follow in the, Lord, in the way of the Lord Jesus because you are a man of God and you are a woman of God who is called to live a life of authority. You are not a victim, but also a life of vulnerability to join Jesus at the fringe of what he's doing in the world. We want to do that with our lives. We want to do that with our relationships. And we certainly want to do it with our finances because we don't want anything to choke out the gospel. And we don't want to have any Lord or any king but God above. Amen? Church, this is what we were called to do. This is who we were called to be. Let's decide to do that. How do you do it? You just decide to. This is who I'm going to be. I'm going to draw a line in the sand. No one can serve two masters, God or money. Well, I'm picking God. And trust the work of the Spirit in your life. And we want to hear when we stand before the throne of grace, the voice of the Father saying over us, well done, good and faithful servant.
our Father in heaven, through the redemption offered in your Son, Jesus, as he leveraged his authority and entered into our vulnerability, we come as sons and daughters before your throne of grace, inviting you to inspire us and empower us to make hard lines, to cut ties in our allegiance to any idol, anything that would rival our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. May we pursue Jesus, unlearning the way of the world and learning for the first time what it means to be a true disciple. Equip and inspire your church to act, to act decisively, to decide to follow Jesus and to decide and decide again to do the same. Glorify yourself, Lord Jesus, in our finances. Glorify yourselves in our lives that your kingdom may come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.